because of the uh, marvellous semi-discipline um, of our panel, we've got a little bit of time left for, uh, for questions. So does anybody want to ask any questions or, or make a, a statement? Okay, okay we'd like to start. Right, I've got a question for Anna, which is um, about the um, Somalia and FGM, because it's said that there was no connection between Islam and FGM. So what is her feeling of thoughts on that? Because I mean, I know that ISIS are doing it at the moment, and they're supposed to do it for Islamic reasons. So, and, but there's people who say that there's no connection. So I wonder what your thoughts on that were. Well, I've heard it said. They said to be doing it. We can't hear it. Sorry. Can, can we you. conduct the, uh, right. yeah. through the microphone so everybody can join? Yeah. I, I've heard, is it working? I just want your thoughts on whether it's connected in, within your own country. Is, is the microphone is the the microphone microphone on? Microphone. Hello? Okay. Um, it's a good question and I must admit I did sort of flash a bit of dread when you asked that question only because not because it's, you know, but it, it, it's one of those topics where I think it, it, lay, it brings up really bad feelings. Um, Sorry. Oh. No, no, it's, 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 it's not an issue. I, I personally, I mean, in Somalia, about 98, I would say even 99% of girls um, undergo FGM. And I, I, I had it done when I was a young girl. And... Um, the reasons that were used were my, my parents or my family were very religious people and there are the reasons that were used were religious um, we as Somalis, as Muslims are obsessed with um, virginity and, keep, and, and keeping a girl um, sexually pure so one of the ways that they devised to do this is to um, circumcise a girl. Now there's different forms of it. Yeah. Um, the very religious people sort of don't cut everything off, they cut off the clitoris for example. Um, and and, and it's, it's seen as a way of reducing a woman's desire so she doesn't succumb to zina or, or having sex um, either outside of marriage or with someone else. Um, so yes, it is linked. Um, it was practiced at the time of Muhammad. Um, in fact, there are hadiths that uh, religious people use um, where Muhammad was described, was basically saying when the two circumcised organs meet, then they have to have a shower. So, he, you know, he talked about it as a sideline because it was the norm back then. Women were circumcised in his society. So it was something that predated Islam, but that Islam didn't forbid either. And with Islam and the, and the Arab culture being obsessed with a woman's sexuality, it was seen as a way of helping yeah. a woman stay pure. I just thought it was like supposed to be pre-Islamic, so I thought they would have got rid of that because it's pre-Islamic. No, there's there's a lot of practices that that Arab culture had. For example, the hijab, the niqab, covering your face. Those predated Islam, but Islam adopted oh, it and right. and sort of elevated the elevated it to a religious position. But it's um, not universal across the Islam, <coughs> across the Islamic sort of it's, area. It's not. In, you don't get it. Everywhere. Well, I you get it in most Muslim countries. I I'm not sure. I can't. I'm not. Maybe Bosnia. You don't get it in. <laughs> because it's a, it's a school of thought. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. so uh, mandatory in other school of thought. It's not. It's okay. Not, but it's, in some is recommended, but not Okay, so... So that is why it's, it's not time. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I'm not aware of an Islamic country where it's not practiced. Okay. It's not practiced in Asia. Okay. No, no. And in Asia. Yes, yes. Some communities in India. In Pakistan as well? No, it's, 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 it's not a widespread thing in Pakistan. Well, I, yeah, I think Imad just wants to make a, a, a quick comment about that. Sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah, it is now. Uh, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I just want to add that even in Tunisia, in post-revolution, -revolu post-Arab Spring Tunisia, 
one of the MPs of Allah, the Islamist party, said that the West just exaggerates on FGM, it was just some kind of a Islamic plastic surgery. <laughs> and it was women want to do it. And um, it is uh, now there is um, uh, an increase of FGM in Tunisia, in Algeria, and in some mountains of Morocco as well. Okay. Thanks. Next, please. Uh, okay, I just basically uh, just sitting there. It's not really a question. It's just if we can say it's a contribution. Just basically want to make a point. I probably try to um, bridge a gap, which I think exists between uh, ex-Muslims in general, because I am an ex-Muslim. Then it's basically a post-religious uh, era. There are two main view of religion between the people who become apostates. In this, I mean, just knowing a few ex-Muslims. Some people are remain critical and continue criticizing religion, and they are outspoken about it. But for uh, the other style is just to keep quiet about it. It's just basically, it was something in the past, and you're not going to offend anyone because of it. I think it totally is, this, this came up just in the previous session. We had a bit of that going on. I think there should be an understanding that people become one of these two groups depending on their personal experiences to our religion. If you are a person who are born in 1980s Iran, uh, religion is not something personal for you. It's something which you had to deal with all your life as a political force. Therefore, you oppose it as, an op as a political force. While when you are a person who are born in 1980s in Europe, religion has always been a very personal matter to you. It has never really affected your life. So you can, without any hard feeling, just put it in the past and move on from it. I think there should be an understanding between the two groups in order to kind of, you know, bridge the gap between themselves in order to, you know, to move on in the future. That's just basically it. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Thank you. Um, I think we will all agree that Islamic scripture contains some uh, very scary ideas, but uh, I guess that is not unique to Islam. Uh, we've seen it in other, uh, in other religious scriptures. And of course, uh, some of these very dangerous ideas are teachings on apostasy and how apostates uh, should be punished. Now, there is also, you know, if you look at Old Testament, uh, there is a pa passage that says that uh, if your brother starts worshipping God that your uh, ancestor didn't know, you should kill him. Uh, so, but people do not subscribe to this um, view anymore. Uh, and my uh, question is, what is your view of, on, um, uh, basically, on uh, an Islamic reformation where uh, religion becomes uh, less dangerous because I realistically do not, uh, I cannot see that there would be some um, a mass apostasy that everyone will uh, abandon Islam and uh, suddenly all these problems uh, and all this violence that comes from uh, religious teaching will suddenly disappear uh, with this solution. I, I, I realistically don't think it's possible. I, I think that is probably more realistic to uh, that religion would be reformed from within and become less uh, uh, become less dangerous as it happened in, as as we have seen in Europe. And uh, would you um, support people uh, who uh, are looking to um, uh, to in interpret these uh, scriptures in a in a way that is uh, uh, more that is not as that is more humane. Let's put it that, that way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, who would like to talk about that? Uh, Everybody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh right, we've, we've, got, we've got a number before we answer that. Okay, so something that's come up is about um, the disappointment with the left and talking to liberals. 
I think if a liberal can brand your particular brand of argument racist, they can, in a way, ignore it. So even though we might not care about being branded Islamophobic or racist for talking about these issues, we kind of need to get past that for people to listen and be able to talk to them. So I'd like to ask your advice, in a way, on how to talk about these issues without having people then brand you either Islamophobic or racist, um, because it just shuts down conversation. Aha, uh -huh, a thousand dollar question. Um, I, uh, I have a very quick comment about what Imad said. Uh, Imad, don't be disappointed by the humanists, you know, what about humanists, who have set up kind of, I mean, you know what I mean, the organization, set up kind of a church for uh, secularists, they like it this way. Or don't be disappointed by, don't, do not be disappointed by the very traditional left, that has nothing to do, they belong to the past, they have nothing to do with this society, they have nothing to do with this huge, massive, humane movement which is being led by these people around you. I mean, you have to be really, really hopeful. You, you, belong, to, you belong to a very, very progressive movement that is huge, that is massive, and you have to be very hopeful. I do totally understand where you're coming from. When I came to the UK, I was kind of disappointed as well. The first time at, like an, uh, at an English school, uh, I was told to tell a joke, just to practice English, and I told a joke about Muhammad. The teacher... <laughs> that was my, our daily life in Iran. <laughs> so, but the thing is, immediately the teacher, well, well I don't want to label her, but a uh, British white person, she was like, no, 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 don't say that. That offends people. But, well, you know, I was like, whoa, where am I? Until, until I found, until I found my inspiration, seeing right there, Mariam Namaz. <laughs> she, she didn't give me and and millions and millions hope for a better future, for a secular, a, a secular society where we can believe in whatever we want. Don't be disappointed. You must see this massive movement, and I don't think you are actually recognizing it. You recognize what a huge massive movement you belong to. Let me just say two more sentences. The, 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 the revolution in Egypt belongs to you, belongs to this movement. They stood up for a better life. The protest in France belongs to this movement. It does not belong to those head of states that when they run two pictures together, yeah. it, they, it does not belong to anybody except this movement and people who are sitting right here and some of those who are not here. But there is October conference. I'm sorry, sir, we, we've only got 10 minutes left. No, Eva, stay there. Very quick, very quick. Yeah, I, we, we've got people on the panel want to answer the questions that have been asked already. I'm sorry about that. popular acclaim, I actually wanted to pick Terry up about uh, the Christianity being written off in Europe. I just want to say that while the Christians do not, uh, and Jews, do not kill people who leave them, they destroy their lives. Yes. And yes. as much as uh, uh, this session is about Islam, I think the destruction of individuals within other religions who dare to leave exists in a big way, and in women in particular. We do have very powerful Christian uh, movements in Russian Orthodoxy, in Irish Catholicism, just no, the two as examples. It has to be very brief. I am an ex-Muslim, very big ex-Muslim, by the name of Ali Sina. He runs a website called faithfreedom.org. And I am reading Everything in that website, everything is exposed. There is a book also written by an American author. Uh, it is called Prophet of Doom. It has got 24 chapters. It, it tells all about Islam in this day and age, what it is doing to humanity. And people should take note of those uh, links I have given. And, uh, one is Alicina 
in the name Iranian scholar, ex-Muslim, of course, he has got a huge following in the digital space it's website. Especially okay. around the far right. Patreon.org. <laughs> okay, Patreon.org. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I think we've got uh, just about five or six minutes, so can you keep your contributions really brief? Okay, we'll start here. Do you want to say anything about any other questions or comments? Uh, Uh, well, about the uh, lady that talks about uh, Christians who leave the uh, Christianity nowadays and uh, the consequences that they face. Well, um, that's that. But uh, again, I should uh, pressure on the fact that Christians used to uh, execute um, apostates. So uh, the Muslims shouldn't forget this fact that they need to uh, the law. They get. They need to uh, simply learn from the, uh, the the history that Christianity has gone through, and uh, start uh, accepting the ex-Muslims and apostates. Um, I'd like to make a point about um, that lovely lady. I don't remember your name, but um, is there hope for Islam? And um, <laughs> I generally think there is, and it wasn't something that, a view that I held when I first left um, 10 years ago, but um, subsequently I've had a bit of life experience, and um, I studied uh, Reformed Judaism, and I found that a healing experience actually, because what I found through that is I was able to see that in Judaism, in Christianity, people went through the exact same thing. It's just that Muslims are going through it now in the 21st century. Um, and the way forward, I think, is sorry. The, I don't. The, the way forward, I think, is probably the way that what you know what Jews and, and Christians have found is. The Qur'an now is seen by Muslims, the accepted view is it is the literal word of Allah and it cannot be changed. And we have to take it as, as, as it is. And I think once people, uh, Muslims, get to the point where they say, okay, well, maybe there is a human element into this. Maybe, okay, it was inspired by God, but there is a human influence in this. Then, I think, then there will be a way to, the, uh, that will open doors to reform or, um, a reinterpretation that would be meaningful and could be um, seen as modern. So I do hold hope. Um, I didn't in the past, but definitely I think um, there is hope. Hello. Well, even though I am so anti-Islam, but um, um, speaking about reinformation in Islam, I, I don't actually find um, our fight, like the anti-Islam people, are very important as it's very important for those who want to make reformation as well, because um, uh, we um, we kind of have a, a one team. But to reform Islam, you have to uh, you have to face the things that is not right and say it's not right, and we have to move on. We cannot say keep saying like it's a mis um, misinterpretation, uh, misinterpretation. No. it's yeah. not as a lost in translation or whatever no we have to say look okay fine you are right whatever that's wrong it's wrong to kill uh, um, apostate it's wrong to kill uh, non-muslims it's wrong uh, to have women in, is enslaved it's all these all the things are wrong and it's all in in the quran and so we have to say that it is in the quran but we have to move on we have to to who cancel these things from our religion and we have to be to to move on not not let us influence our lives because what Muslim are um, uh, are cannot face like um, the Islamic state or, or uh, Shabab or whatever um, uh, militias they cannot say that it's not Islam because they know deep that it is written in the Quran but they cannot really face it but they have to because I know that there are many people, there are many Muslims that they believe that it's wrong. I come from a Sunni Muslim 
um, uh, family, and uh, my mother is a Muslim, and my mother is, doesn't agree with the uh, ISIS. My family doesn't agree with all this, um, with all what's happening. But they are still Muslims, and I do believe that if they had, if they think that it's it's uh, what's happening is wrong, then they have to stand up and say it is wrong. It's in our religion when we have to. Uh, we have to take it out of our religion and we have to move on and we have to be all together. And uh, another point about racism and uh, Islamophobia. Uh, well, I don't think that there is any uh, solution for that because any uh, any person who doesn't agree with you will, will call you a name, either Islamophobic racism or whatever other name. But in, uh, deep down, when you, we shouldn't let this um, these words stop us from talking. If we are called Islamophobic, okay, fine, Islamophobic, Islamophobic. I still want to say my opinion, and then people will then like even if they disagree with you, they are still going to go to their home and they will think of what you said, and they will maybe they will go and search and look up all uh, many things. I mean, in my personal um, experience, I had uh, so many friends who are Muslims. But we are friends, and then suddenly they, they start like, in the beginning they, we never spoke about religion because they don't like my thoughts. Well, <laughs> I didn't want to lose them as friends, so we kept this thing out of our friendship, but then uh, after a while they start listening, they, they are fine with it, they are becoming okay. So this is what other people are doing as well, even if they call you uh, racist, racist or Islamophobic, then they heard your word at the end, and they would think of it. Um, I'll be. I'll try to be brief. So, um, so Reza, um, as many people say that they are disappointed of the left by they belong to the left. Uh, I think that, um, as um, uh, my friend talked about, like um, working together between different kinds of ex-Muslims, I think that ex-Muslim and humanists are the same. And I think that uh, they are our big allies against all fascists and uh, people who don't believe in human rights and democracy. Um, for, um, I would say about reforming Islam, actually I think that uh, as uh, Hamdak Samad, my friend, uh, who fled to New York because he was too critical of Islam in Germany, huge Germany and he fled to New York because of threats and because of police can't do anything for him. He said the Arabs should reform their understanding of reformation and should change their understanding of change itself. I think that those words are misunderstood. Um, actually, Muhammad Abdul Wahab did the reformation in Islam. Bin Laden did the reformation in Islam. So the question is, which reformation we want? And not a reformation. Islam was being reformed by the Dubendis, by Ibn Hanbal, by Shafi'i, by Al Afghani, by so many others. Uh, and I've been lucky to um, study among many school of Islam, Islamic school of thoughts and. Um, here is the hub of Islam. I'm, I'm pessimist, not like I'm out, but here, here is the situation. Actually, you have all the recognized branches of Islam, which is eight by Al-Azhar, including Jafarism as well, which is of Iran. And all of those branches, which is, makes 99% of Muslims, so all those liberal and moderate, and Ahmadi and so well, as uh, an endangered minority, just like us ex-Muslims, uh, uh, all those branches doesn't define Muslim by just anyone who describes himself as a Muslim. And I say himself, but they, they're most men. And uh, of course, uh, even if you're Muslim, in Hanbali faith, uh, or uh, Sunni Hanbali uh, school, if you didn't pray three times in a row, in a day, we can kill you and make a barbecue for you and eat you. And this is in the books of Al Azhar, Al Egyptian Azhar. So, um, reformation is first of all to give other Muslims the right to, to, to be in countries. 
In Morocco, there is an automatic state designation as Sunni Maliki Muslims. Inheritance, Sunni Maliki Islam. So if you're a Shia Muslim, if you're a Hanbali Muslim, if you're a Shafi'i Muslim in Morocco, you don't have to write to have your own Islamic rights. So Muslims are persecuting other Muslims as well. Like we know about the Hazara, about so many Ahmadis even, uh, and so on. Second thing, that Islamic branches stop uh, describing people who describe themselves as Muslim as not Muslims. And this is a problem in all Islamic branches. It is the problem of the creed, Islamic Aqidah. So there is a huge list of what makes a Muslim a Muslim. So if you actually in the Sunni, most Islamic um, school of thoughts in Islam, and um, actually if you say that Sahih al-Bukhari is not a good book, you can be killed. If you say that Ibn Hanbal or Ibn Taymiyyah are not good, you can be killed. If, and, uh, um, like people say about a mockery of Muhammad, I'll tell you uh, in a hadith, what is mockery of Muhammad? There's a hadith to say that if there's something in a uh, clothes of Muhammad and somebody said, um, it, it's dirty, should be killed. And you say like, Muhammad is black, he should be killed. This is the mockery in Islam because it's different than what, what we think. Uh, we have uh, many United Nations now, which is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and I wrote that in the AHU Freedom of Thought report. I wrote a big, um, um, like, a uh, few um, paragraphs on that. Uh, they believe that blasphemy, which is um, like many United Nations with 57 countries, with 1.4 billion Muslims around the world, the good Muslims who are not terrorists, they say that blasphemy is the worst form of terrorism. Exactly. Worse than killing Muslims, worse than killing Yazidis, worse than all the terroristic attacks, is to make a cartoon. So, I don't see Muslims saying, no, we don't want to be part of this organization. Here, the problem in the West, why people in the West cannot make a rapture with Islamic, uh, with a traditional Islam, if we can say, of course, because of money, because of slogans. So, I put an Islamic organization and I say, we are firmly committed for democracy and human rights within our national and religious identity. And I get the money from the West and the money from the East, of course. <coughs> this is why we cannot, we I can't see any future for any right Islam within marginal groups. Actually, in India, and I think there's people from India here, Ahmadis are not recognized as Muslims, are not represented in the Pakistan, big... Pakistan, Pakistan. Um, in uh, Pakistan, are not represented in... In, 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 um, well, uh, so there is um, a council of, of Islamic association, it's in India, I'm sure. And Ahmadis are not represented in this council of Islamic associations. So, or Bangladesh, or anyway. So, uh, uh, there is, um, I don't like to speak about theology, but I think um, freedom of expression, academic freedom of expression, no Muslims have not to write to depict Quran. There is actually manuscripts of Quran in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Mali that have been destroyed by, by the terrorists. And for no Muslims, they don't have the right as academics to, to like assist and to see these manuscripts and to have a better understanding of Islam and to know that Islam was written uh, and the Prophet probably didn't exist. And probably um, uh, Quran was written in the Amawids religion was written in Aleppo and not Mecca and that all that Mickey and, and Medina uh, verses are actually just uh, the clerics who say that they say that every verse with Kadalik is Mecca and every verse who uh, speak about how you live and about Hudud is Madani but we don't know Actually, the, even the names of the surat are not uh, just people who say, like, uh, find spider, uh, verse of spider, call, verse, surat of call, table, verse of table, women, verse of table. It, like, there, there is nothing, there's, um, we call it istalahi, I don't know how to say it in English, but you just say, fuqaha, uh, clerics, Islamic clerics say, we are going to give names to those verses, and there is on. And people don't know about that, don't know about the Quran, don't know about that. 
uh, we we are have we are really ignorant about the, what happened in history, previous Islamic history, and after the uh, the the Islam history, because we only what we have for uh, like sadly is Islamic uh, his like um, um, history books, and we don't have other accounts of that. So uh, when we have at least freedom of expression in universities to say everything about Quran about all the cultural heritage, and they have a lot to say, but they have families, they have kids to feed, so they can't lose their jobs. And that's a horrible thing. But what, yeah. is, what is the hope for... Can, so, can sorry, I, sorry. I, I, I told you I'm problematic, to, so... Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry to have to... <coughs> okay, sorry. You're so passionate. <laughs> I feel very sorry to have to interrupt you. Sorry. But okay. we are running out of time very quickly. I'll be quickly. very brief. There'll yeah. be a minute and a half. All right. Um, right, so I'm just going to comment quickly about the Reformation. I think whenever we speak about Reformation, um, it all comes back to interpretation. Who interprets, who interprets what and how? Is it literal? Is it whatever? And um, I think that the Reformation battle is an intellectual battle that's supposed to be fought by those who believe in in Islam, this is a, this is something to be fought by those who believe in a God and believe in Islam, um, and it's it's completely separate from the battle that unites me with someone else from a religious background, um, which is secularism. Our fight is a political fight, and it's 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 meant to change the laws um, uh, and and uh, um, promote freedom of expression and. Um, and education, secular education. These are these are the things we need to fight for. And within this, then we can have um, a safe environment to discuss things and challenge each other uh, civilly. Um, so our battle. I, I think whenever we speak about reformation, we get we get into the interpretation who's right and who's wrong. And this is not this is not where we need to fight. Well, our battle is whatever you, however you interpret it. This is your own matter. Our battle is that we need a safe sphere for a sphere for everyone um, to speak out safely and, and openly. Um, the second thing is about the left and co being called um, Islamophobe. I think uh, there is such thing as racism. So it's it is important that we don't just dismiss it. Yes, there. Is racism and racism is uh, discriminating against people um, on the base of things they can change, on the base of their color and the base of their disabilities and, and lots of other things. So there is racism, but to to, to distinguish between the two things, um, hate speech and free freedom, free speech. Hate speech is against against people, um, um, targeting people um, as people and. Um, uh, uh, freedom of expression is, is challenging thoughts and ideologies, which we all can do. So um, I think there's a, there's a phrase that a number of scholars use, and I'll, I'll just quote them on that. Uh, inclusion and respect are for people, not beliefs. We have every right to criticize, mock, make fun of whatever whatever sort we want, and um, uh, but not people. So um, maybe we should distinguish between the two, and uh, I think that'll, that'll help us um, uh, help us uh, be on the safe side, but it, you'll still be called racist. This is this is the thing. You'll still be called racist. You'll still be called Islamophobe. And as someone who's anti-Islam as well, um, I I am anti-Islam, but I, I do I do respect people and and people's right to speak out and uh, um, uh, speak out safely and freely. So these these are two th different things to distinguish: hate speech, hate against people, and free speech. Well, that, that got very heated towards the end after a tentative start. Shame we didn't look the other way around and get the passion in at the beginning. But um, thank you very much for the panel. They've given us some excellent speeches and talks and, and comments afterwards. Um, but I realise that there'll be people needing to get off the train, so I shall not detain you any longer except to say the star of the show is yet to appear. And so we'll call Mariam to give her final speech.